We're studying what it means to walk in the light, to walk with God, to walk in his fellowship. We've looked at confession, we've looked at forgiveness and obedience, we've looked at resisting Satan's terrorism, and today we get down to the hard work of spiritual discipline, the work of being trained in godliness. Our text is from the book of Hebrews, great text in chapter 12, and I'll begin reading at verse 1. <clears throat> Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you've forgotten the word of encouragement that addressed you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. The previous chapter to this, the book of Hebrews, is a great hall of fame of biblical heroes. <clears throat> From Adam to Noah, to Abraham and Sarah, from Jacob to Joseph to Moses, from Joshua and Rahab to Gideon and Samson, from men who conquered kingdoms and administered justice to women who received their dead back to life. Now our text begins with all of these historical figures <clears throat> portrayed as encircling, uh, encircling you like a crowd of spectators cheering for us. What the author does here is he paints a word picture of a Roman amphitheater where we're on the field as athletes. In those days, male athletes would strip off any clothing that would, that would hamper movement. Think spandex. Um, but in this analogy, uh, the race is a race of faith. It's a challenge to walk with God in Jesus Christ. So what hampers us, what entangles us, what hinders us and slows us down would be our sin. So as spiritual athletes, we have to cast all that aside, get rid of it. And then verses 2 and 3, Jesus is lifted up as our perfect example. He, not only is he the object of our faith, the, only, the one we believe in, but he's also the example of our faith, the one we should imitate. An athlete pushes hard for the joy of fame. Jesus pushed hard for the joy of pleasing his Father and saving us. An athlete endures hard competition. Jesus endured the cross a victorious athlete approaches whatever celebrity presides over the games and gets a prize. The risen Jesus approached God the Father and received eternal honor and authority. And then in verses 4 to 6, the author transplants the idea of discipline that he's been developing from the arena to the home by quoting a verse from Proverbs. I mean, an athletic image is only going to take you so far because not everybody is an athlete, Right? But virtually everyone in the ancient world grew up with a father or a father figure. And a father is a kind of coach or trainer in the home. 
That was really true, you see, in the ancient world, whether in the Roman part of it or the Jewish part of it. The training of young children was a father's job. Nursing infants were cared for by women, but once a child, especially a son, got past the toddler stage, the father took over the training. The father's task was to make sure that every son was ready to succeed in the world. And that wasn't the job he would give to any school, any institution, any religion, any government. It was his job. It meant teaching right and wrong. It meant teaching self-control and responsibility. It meant to teach how to conduct yourself honorably, successfully, and how to lead a new family when the time came. Whatever was required to shape a young man for adulthood, the father did it. And the author's point here is that God is a heavenly father for the children he has in Christ, and he disciplines all his children, both sons and daughters. He trains each of us, just like a coach would with an athlete, he just got finished talking about, only a father's 24-7 and involves all of life, not just sports. Then the passage goes on to give some valuable tips about how to work with God as your father, trainer, coach. Over time, this passage has become really important to me. It's, it's taken me a while to, to understand it and appreciate it. It's my experience that a lot of Christians have trouble with it because there are two common notions, at least, that I think need to be challenged and, uh, and corrected for a lot of us. And I'm going to just mention what I think they are. First, I think that we have largely lost the biblical idea of discipline. I think it has kind of shrunk down to mean basically punishment. Now, discipline includes punishment. But why has it shrunk down to only mean that? Well... This would be a nice discussion, and feel free to debate this point with me, but I think it's because in our culture, the only discipline that most adults and parents actually are participate in is punishment. In America, parents have largely stopped training their children. I don't say that to criticize, I just to observe the kind of culture we have built for ourselves. We don't even see our kids that much. Ancient Jews and ancient Romans, they trained their own children. They spent all day, you know, in the same house and working together. We feed and we clothe our kids. We love them to death. We play with them. We support them. But in our culture, typically, parents do not train their children how to live. We have relegated that training of our children to at least three other sources. Large one, of course, is the school, both uh, public and private. Uh, the media. I learned an awful lot growing up from television. Now the TV is not as important, perhaps, as the Internet. And the third, the third group that trains uh, kids is, uh, is kids, uh, peer groups, and, and then again, the Internet. And this is how children are trained to actually live, what they, to actually how to get by in life. My point here is not to rail against the Internet or anything else. My point is to say that typically, most of the time that, that parents, that adults get involved in their children's training is when there's a major problem and a child acts out in a destructive or objectionable way and then they have to punish them. Punishment is the piece of discipline that most adults are most familiar with and so we tend to think that discipline is only punishment. So when we think of God disciplining us, we think mostly in terms of his punishing us. Well, the fact is punishment is just one piece of training or discipline. Discipline involves at least four components. And it's fascinating that when, when Paul spoke to Timothy about the, how God works with us in the scriptures, he talks about all four of them. He says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness. And there they are, the four aspects of discipline. First, there is teaching. Teaching is the intellectual basis for good behavior. It's an explanation of what God requires. It's kind of theoretical, but that's how you begin, by getting down the facts of God's will and God's word. That's what all preaching and teaching and Bible studies and everything, that's what that's all about. But of course, this training goes a lot beyond that. For training, it's got to be individually applied, okay, to how we're doing it and how we're not doing it. So the second part is rebuking. Rebuking is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Rebuking deals with specifying where we have gone off course from God's teaching. And that will be different for each one of us. But God wants us to do this, and we've kind of swerved off, off the path. And rebuke isolates what is wrong with an individual person and individual behavior. And if necessary, if necessary, and the, if it's appropriate, maybe punishment is used 
to make wrong behavior counterproductive. You see, in training, punishment is, is never done to judge or to condemn, but it's done to make wrong behavior less attractive. The third thing is, of course, then correcting. It's getting back on path. It's never enough to rebuke or punish by itself. You've got to carefully explain why something is wrong and why the truth, why God's way is much, much better. Correction is when that general teaching gets very practical to you and me in our particular situation. And then finally, we get back to training in righteousness. You get back to teaching, but now, having mastered one thing, you move on to the next thing. You go through all the fundamentals, and then you go up to more advanced subjects until the entire uh, breadth of righteousness is covered. And of course, this process is repeated over and over and over. You're going along God's path, you've gotten off the path, this is how you've gotten off, this is how you get back, this is how, and then you go on to the next. You go on and on. What this text tells us is that our Heavenly Father is personally training each one of us himself. And what that means. He doesn't delegate our training to anybody else. Not to a school, not to a TV, not to peer groups or the internet, not even to the church, and ultimately not even to parents. Now God appreciates it very much when parents or the school or the church support his word, but he does not automatically assume that any of them will Nobody can raise you the way God wants to raise you. What he wants to do is a whole lot more than punish you. He wants to train you to become like somebody very, very special. To get what this text is saying, the first thing we have to do is rethink our idea of discipline. It's not just punishment. It's everything that's involved in comprehensive training. And in Christ, God has become our trainer. The second thing we have to rethink, well, it's harder, it's bigger, and that is how much we need to be trained. How much we need discipline. I'm not talking about kids, I'm talking about Christians, all of us, any age. Once we're out of diapers, and we learn to read and walk and, and we survive puberty and learn to drive and get a job and maybe have a family, we think we're grown up. Because we've learned to do just about everything a human being has to do. So when we come to Christ, we tend to think that we just need to tweak some of our behavior, curb some of our appetites, become a little nicer, religious. Friend, we just have no idea how much we need to learn, relearn, unlearn. We don't appreciate the fact that we have only learned one way to do what human beings have to do. And in the vast majority of cases, what we have learned is not the right way. It is not God's way. Now, it may be it's half God's way and half Satan's way. But that makes it all wrong. Does that make sense? Let's say you have a carton of fresh milk. Wonderful fresh milk. And you have a carton of spoiled milk. The use by date is last August. Okay? And you pour them both into a big bowl. You gonna drink that? Why not? It's half fresh. Doesn't work that way. It's all bad. Fellow Christians, the truth is, we got to be prepared to relearn everything that we have been taught. Now some things that we have learned may well be close enough to what God wants, but we don't know that until we've tested it. Coming to Christ is like reclaiming a home after a major flood. The house is going to be renewed. It's going to become better than ever. But when you go in, you have to go in assuming that anything may need to be replaced or repaired. Now, maybe some of it's okay. Maybe the brickwork in that uh, uh, fireplace is okay. Maybe you can clean it up. Maybe those things on the mantle, whatever they are, maybe they can be cleaned up and used again. I don't know. But you don't know that when you go in. You, everything has to be tested, evaluated. And then what is ruined has got to be ripped out, it's got to be thrown out, it's got to be redone. 
And that includes everything from our personal hygiene and how we treat the temple of God to our politics that we didn't learn from God to our budget to our sex and family life to anything and everything you could name yes we have already learned life one way but if we want to walk in the light if we want to walk with God we've got to learn to live his way Wow, that sounds like we need help. We do. We need spiritual training or discipline. Training. The way you would need training if you were taking up a new sport, which is how we got to this place in the text, right? Nobody starts out in any sport successful. Nobody does. We've already learned how to run and we've learned how to throw and we've learned how to swing and all that kind of stuff. But that doesn't mean we can do any of those things well, okay? Especially in terms of a sport. We're gonna have to relearn that stuff. Some start out more coordinated than others, gifted, but gifts will only take you so far. Success in any sport alone is gonna require consistent hard work, relearning how to do the things that you already knew how to do. I played tennis for years. I used to watch, this is going back a ways, I used to watch Rod Laver and uh, Jimmy Connors and Bjorn Borg, and I thought winning tennis was a matter of making those great shots. And there's a lot of truth to that, great shots are important, but once you get into tennis, you realize that that's not the most important thing at all. In tennis, the person who wins is the person who makes the fewest mistakes because consistently hitting a ball over a given height so that it lands in a particular area with speed and control is amazingly difficult to do over and over and over again. I remember a certain concrete wall very, very well. I spent hours and hours trying to keep a, distant, a decent rally going with an inanimate object, okay? So how do you know if you're improving? Well you get into a real game with real people. You put yourself out there where your skill is tested. And then you can see, not just if you're doing well, but if you're doing better than you did before and what you need to still work on. Testing yourself does not determine your worth as a human being. And that's something that good parents and good coaches are careful to keep teaching. But testing does, it does demonstrate your current mastery of a skill. On the basis of real world interaction, testing, you see what you need to work on. And then you practice some more, anticipating the next text, the next interaction. Christian, until you and I have spent quality time with our Heavenly Father and Coach, and until our godliness is tested in the real world, we don't know squat about walking in the light. We could be worldly experts in any field and still be utter novices when it comes to living like Jesus Christ. That's not an insult. It's not a criticism. It's a fact. Why wouldn't we be novices? Why would anybody know how to play tennis or sew or play the violin or do anything until they're taught how to do it? And what this text says is that learning how to walk with God requires training, like training for a sport. Lots of teaching, lots of rebuke and correction to apply it, and then ongoing training in righteousness. Spiritual training or discipline never seems pleasant because it's hard work. It's directed toward change, toward doing something you already do differently. It's hard. It's going to stretch you, okay? I can't say that hours and hours of hitting a ball against a wall was pleasant, but the results are worth it. They are worth it. The results are fantastic. You master a sport, and you're going to enjoy that sport the rest of your life. You're going to have fun. You're going to scrupulously obey the rules, and within those rules, you're going to strive to excel in the game. And you know when you do. You master godliness and you enjoy godliness the rest of your life. You will scrupulously obey God's law and within that law strive to excel at love and at righteousness. And you know when you do. How do you know if you're learning anything? Through the testing of your faith 
in the real world. You will never know how patient, how just, how loving you've become until, until that quality in you is tested. Until you are faced with a need that calls for generosity. Or an injustice against someone else that calls for intervention and godly support. Or an injustice against you that calls for forgiveness and confidence in God's provision. Or the collapse of a dream which may call for repentance from some idolatry. Or the inevitable approach of death which calls for great humility and hope. The most important thing about those challenges is what they reveal about you. They have some intrinsic significance, of course, because it's real life. But come on. Paul puts these things in perspective. How, how, how much... How much will even dealing with death mean a hundred years from now in God's renewed kingdom? The testings and the hardships of this life have no more eternal meaning. They have temporal meaning. They have no more eternal meaning than a tennis match. And the most important thing about them is how they document your spiritual growth in God's will. So what practical tips does the author give for the discipline of walking with God? He says a couple things. Then in verse 12, he says to strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. You got places where you're, where you're weak. You got to work on your weakness. We're talking about sin. You got to work on your moral weakness. There are some contexts in which it is important to concentrate on your positive strengths. But when it comes to walking with God, it is more important to uh, work on areas where your sin is strong. It's good to strengthen your gifts. It's better to overcome your sin. Cast it away. Because sin has a way of sabotaging your gifts. Sin has a great deal of leverage to neutralize your strengths. For example, a pastor could work hard for years and years and years to hone preaching and leadership skills only to lose the opportunity to preach and to lead through a moral failure. Failure, failure does not kick us out of the race any more than it kicks us out of God's house, but it can be very damaging. It can be very costly and time-consuming. Then he says in verse 13, make level paths for your feet so that what is lame won't be disabled. See, if, if testing and trial and hardship, if through that you discover a weakness in yourself, in anything, Maybe you're weak as a peacemaker. Maybe you're weak as a faithful husband or weak in, in patience, whatever it is. You gotta try to modify your environment to stop tripping yourself up. Our brothers on the retreat are giving a lot of thought to the problems of pornography. Any man can become weak in this area. If, testing, if in testing you discover that about yourself, then a man has got to change his environment. He's got to discourage access and use of pornography. He may find it very useful to discuss how he's doing with a friend or others. Because without purposeful change, what is at present just a mild limp can worsen into a real and lasting disability. And that's true in any area where you see yourself tripping up. Well, do what you can to change your environment and your habits to, to make level paths for yourself. That's only common sense. And if you're new to this business of personal discipleship and personal discipline, well, the author gives a few good areas to start with. This is not a list of postgraduate topics. These are essential entry-level courses. If you're in testing, you score weak, you score low in any of these areas, then start here. Maybe it's living at peace with other people. Good place to start. Maybe it's living with a sense of God's holy calling upon your life. Start there. Maybe it's, it's stop letting bitterness rob you and other people of God's grace. Wow, great place to start. And so is learning sexual purity. Christian, don't hide from practice just because you'll get sweaty. Don't stay discouraged when you completely blow a match. Instead, work with your coach 
who is also your dad. Listen to his rebuke. Let him correct you. There is so much more to learn. There is so much more he wants to teach. Let's get this thing down pat so we can move on. You do that. And the time will come when you will walk back on the field and the bleachers will fill again with brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers who were tested the way you're being tested now and they're rooting for you. And you will play the best game you ever played. You might win. Maybe you'll lose by less. But the important thing is you did some things out there that you couldn't do before. And I'm not talking about tennis. You sacrificed yourself for God's glory and the good of others in a way that reminded people of Jesus Christ. Never saw that before. You endured opposition. You gave, you forgave. You served, you stood firm, you loved. And just like Jesus, you did it with joy. When you walk off the field from that trial, you will see the pride in your heavenly Father's eyes. Not because you won or lost some worldly score that neither one of you is going to bother remembering, but because you reminded him of your elder brother. Now, most elder brothers don't deserve that kind of hero worship, but ours does. And he is the first one on his feet to applaud your effort. Of all people, he understands the cost. And he rejoices in what you have achieved so far. Christian, you experience the pleasure of your heavenly father and the delight of Jesus Christ once. And you're going to want it every day. Not to get saved, but because you are saved and you like it. You'll want more training, extra training, so that after the next test you'll see his face again, not reflecting to you what you still aren't, but what you have already become. And that, I believe, that's walking in the light. Let's uh, pray in preparation for the table. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we're a group here of all ages, not just physically, but spiritually. Some of us have known you just a little, but have already advanced through several lessons. And some of us have known you a long time, but we've just repeated the same lesson over and over. Today, we all, fix our eyes on Jesus and we see the master. We see the champion of the contest of being human. He had it all. He did it all. Could you teach us to be like him? Could you teach us to, to play the game and run the race like him? What do you want us to do? Should we start working on our bitterness or our purity or, or living at peace. You're the father. You're the coach. You tell us. Tell us as we come to your son's table right now. As we thank you for him. As we rejoice in the finished work that's already given us eternal life. Father, you tell us what, we want, what you want us to work on. Not to be saved. Christ's already done that. But, but tell us what we need to work on next to walk in the light. And then, Father, you train us to get there. Oh, listen to this prayer, God, for we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, it's broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he he took the cup and he said this, this is my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it as often as you do this in remembrance of me. Because as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, 
we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Now I invite you to his table.